John, you ready to rock and roll? Yep. Let's go. All right, let's do it. Welcome first time listeners and returners to the Sports Deli, where we believe that less is more. If you less stands for leadership, equality, empowerment, empathy, education, social injustice, suicide prevention, sports, and solutions. We talk a lot about white privilege. We want to mobilize and pay it forward. The Sports Deli is sponsored by Sport RX. You can give them a call at 888-831-5817 or find them online at sportrx.com. Don't forget to enter the code DELI10 at checkout for your special 10% discount. And now a little bit about your two co-hosts. Dr. J he loves politics. His dad was a civil rights lawyer. He loves golf. He's he played. loves the All-American at Waffle House. As for myself, Hootie Hoot, I'm from Detroit. I got cut three times. Once I played four years of college basketball. I still hold a record where I made five out of six three-pointers in a game. I've coached men's and women's college basketball for 23 years. I have a beautiful daughter. I'm a life coach. And I'm honored to be coaching girls basketball at a low-income, first-generation high school here in San Diego, California. Don't forget, you can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com, or you can DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. And with that being said, we are honored during this ninth day of Women's History Month, the day before my birthday and one week before the start of March Madness, to welcome an incredible person and a former collegiate and professional basketball player with one of the best names in the history of sports. Six foot eleven inch Ruben Boomche Boomche hails to us from Adea, Cameroon, known for its contemporary dance music genre, Makosa, and is located in Central Africa. Cameroon, one of fifty-four African countries, has had the same president for nearly forty years and has twenty-five million people, the equivalent of the states of New York, Washington D.C., which is not a state but should be, and South Carolina, combined with double the miles in terms of area. It has only one of the three waterfalls of all of Africa that empty into the ocean. When he wears his basketball shoes, he's actually seven feet, not 6'11". He shares a birthday with Israel Kamika Vivole, famous Hawaii singer of Somewhere Over the Rainbow, Cher, James Stewart, and Busta Rhymes. He came to the U.S. in 1996, where he attended Washington, D.C.'s Archbishop Carroll High School, famous for sending numerous players to the NFL and the NBA, like current college coach Johnny Dawkins, Lawrence Poetry and Moten, Eddie Jordan, and his former college coach, the late Hall of Famer, Big John, John Thompson. Michael Steele and former college basketball coach Mike Lonergan also attended Carroll. He went on to play for the late John Thompson at Georgetown before he retired and who Craig Esherick, his head coach after Big John retired, referred to as one of the smartest players Georgetown ever had on and off the court. Mike Sweetney, a former teammate, called Ruben an amazing person and one of his favorite teammates that he ever played with. He has a math and pre-med major and was drafted by the Portland Trail Blazers in the 2001 draft as the 50th overall pick where he played until 2004. Ruben was an incredible student and was a three-time recipient of the team's Scholar Athlete Award at Georgetown and was also named Big East Scholar Athlete of the year in 2001. and was named Big East Scholar Athlete of the Year in 2001. He played with the likes of Scotty Pippen, current Warriors head coach Steve Kerr, Zach Randolph, former Michigan State Spartan, Rasheed Wallace, and Damon Stoudemire. He was coached by Sixers great Mo Cheeks in Portland before he went to play overseas for seven years, but only in countries that started with the letter G, Greece <laughs> and Germany. He speaks three languages and earned his master's degree in applied mathematics and statistics, also from Georgetown University. He's a data scientist who has an interest in metrics, which we will get into later, as it relates to sports and has held various jobs in this area, from Siemens Energy to the Philadelphia 76ers organization, where he was most recently a technical scout and the assistant general manager for their G League affiliate, the Delaware Bluecoats. He still tries to play ball once a week, and although he used to hate running, he now runs at least once a week for 45 minutes. You cannot find him on social media anywhere by choice other than LinkedIn, which is where I reached out to him, and he was so gracious enough to answer me and agree to join us today. Hey, Ruben, way to get that karma, and a huge warm welcome to the Sports Deli. I know, Michael. Go ahead. 
How you doing, John? Good. How are you? I'm good. What's happening? I'm not much. Trying to manage four kids. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, thank you for having me. That was uh, and, an extraordinary presentation. <laughs> and I got to add one more thing. Ruben yes. was the fourth leading leader in blocks in the history of, of his college, which, okay, you're number four. You know who he's behind? Let me tell you who's behind. Patrick <laughs> Ewing, Alonzo Mourning, and Dikembe Mutombo. You might have heard of some of these guys. <laughs> that's right. So when you say you're the fourth and the other three are Hall of Famers, that's pretty damn good, Ruben. Yeah, it, it was – it is great. And I played three years, really. So who knows what could have gone. Right. Uh, no, I mean, those are unbelievable guys, of course, guys that I look up after you know when I was there just uh, trying to get some knowledge from them once in a while when they um, will come around for us to play basketball you know over the summer so um, yeah it's it, it was the it's what I did the best really <laughs> black shot and play and rebound and, and trying to play defense so um, it's great to be a, a among those guys but hall of favor and some of the great great players this game ever yeah. seen. Ruben, he's he, John's the guy that would know who you were from a half mile away from the back of your head <laughs> with a hat on in the snow. John, you made an adjustment to your headphones. I'm very, I'm very impressed. Thank did the you. president of did the president of the college say something to you? And and uh, no, no, I'm the only one that comments is you. You, I think you have a problem in your in your setup, whatever the sketch is there. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with my setup? Oh. I mean, where do I begin? <laughs> Ruben, help me out here, man. I can help right, you. <laughs> so, so I'm going to jump in here, Ruben. I grew up in DC. I went to Bethesda Chevy Chase, and one of, and I was I'm older than you, obviously. So I was I grew up in the day when Patrick Ewing stepped on the Georgetown campus and absolutely transformed that college to a basketball power. You know, I went to get the games at the Cap Center. But one of the things you touched on, there was a summer league on campus at Georgetown that I used to go to. And remember, there was no Metro league. there. Thank you. And it was <laughs> unbelievable. And for like five bucks, a hot dog and a soda, I would just like, I would, I would, I, like someone tipped me off about it because it wasn't that known. I mean, you guys, you're players, so you know it. But the common guy, I'm not a D1 player. But there were actually D3 players in the league, high school guys, and, and, and got pros that would play in the summer. And I walked in that gym, and the, the level of talent was off the charts. And it was just – and it, you, they had a schedule for the day. Like, how it was – this we're, we're dating the people listening out there. It was on paper because nothing was on the internet. And you used to have a schedule of who was playing that day. And then on the other side, you got the roster who was on all these teams – and so I would circle all the games I'm going to stay for so I could see the guys come in. And it was unbelievable for five bucks. And these guys took it seriously. It wasn't like pickup. It was serious stuff. And these guys are in college. You had some D3 guys are obviously really good. Mid D1 guys, high D1 guys, and some reserves in the NBA would come in in the summer. I mean, were you a part of that? Because you're, you're younger than me, so I didn't get to see you. And can you talk about that? Yeah, yeah, I was, I was part of that. Uh, every Georgetown player had to play, you know, summer league. Uh, they always kept us as a team, so we couldn't play with other guys. Um, right. But it was basically a tradition, and it was great because uh, we had a chance to play, like you said, with different guys from different college who came in the area or, or just from the area from different school. And for me, sometimes I was really surprised how talented other kids from you know, quote unquote, lower schools, yeah. you know, how talented they were and how competitive they were. Um, we always trying to win the Kennedy League <laughs> as George Taylor, yeah. just to make sure that nobody come into our, our building and win. But it didn't always happen <laughs> because a lot of teams had really, really good players, you know, who play in Connecticut or whatever, wherever they came from. Um, it was really fun. It, it was really great. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you got a chance to, to live and see that. Uh, it was definitely something we always look forward uh, to. And it definitely helped us grow. I think it helped us improve up as players um, um, the whole summer. It felt like it kept you in shape. Yeah, you, you kind of went against certain guys that maybe, like, in the biggest for us, you, you may not have necessarily had that type of players. 
And so it was a way for us also to improve dramatically and, and gain some confidence that we actually can play against, you know, different type of players from other conferences across the nation that were around. Um, so it was really, it was really good for us. Cool. So I think people know that uh, Joel Embiid is obviously from Cameroon. And, uh, but when you were growing up, uh, soccer, you know, was the big sport and how did you get introduced to basketball, you know, and, and what uh, led you to, to come to the States? Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I grew up like probably most kids playing soccer, as we call it, the real soccer, the real football. That's right. The American. <laughs> um, yeah. So I grew up playing soccer uh, like every kid. And um, I started as a goalie. For some reason, when I was very, very young, I was a goalie. And then um, I started getting tired of hurting my hip because <laughs> I was too tall, <laughs> even at my age. Um, so I moved, like, time playing forward and whatever. And really, when I, I had a really gross spurt when I was 15, that kind of just made me stop. Um, but before that, I was already getting a little tired of playing soccer just because <laughs> my friends were all shorter than me and I couldn't catch up <laughs> with them and falling all that kind of stuff. So my older brother was playing volleyball. And when I was 14, I tried to play volleyball a little bit with him. He was more like playing for a club, was very competitive. But for me, it was more like just fun. So I was kind of looking for something. And I had a friend of mine uh, who actually lives in D.C. right now as well. We grew up together. I've known him since we were 10 years old. Um, he was playing basketball and he's the one who pitched me the idea. So one day, so I was 15 years old. Uh, he asked me, he said, Hey, would you be interested in trying basketball? And I was like, what is basketball? <laughs> so you have to understand that that time in Cameroon and even today, I mean, a lot more people know about basketball, but during that time, it was really, really just soccer. There was right. a, a very small, small number of people who knew about basketball. So I said, okay, why not? And we used to go to school every Wednesday was basically like a half day. So we basically go to school from whatever it was, eight o'clock to 12, and we had the, the, the rest of the day off. And that's when they had practice. So I decided to stay one Wednesday. I went to watch the practice just to see what is basketball. <laughs> so I sat there, watched the entire practice. I was like, wow, I was just impressed, amazed. I was seeing all these guys who were my height or taller, jumping and doing all that kind of stuff. So I got hooked. I went home and I told my mom, I'm going to play basketball. She's like, what is basketball? <laughs> I was like, well, is this for with a different ball? But I said, mom, I need you. Can I please, can you please buy me a, a basketball? So she did that, I think, the, the weekend, mm -hmm. uh, the following weekend. And then I went to the next practice that was the next Wednesday. And I just sat there with the ball, holding, trying to play somehow. <laughs> and after practice, I stepped on the court and I was trying to emulate whatever, you know, I saw the guys doing. Obviously, I didn't know how to dribble. I didn't know anything. I've never, that was my first time even playing. And uh, so the coach of the team saw me and then came to me. I'm sure my friend told him something. <laughs> I never actually asked him about it. Wow. But the coach of the team came and told me, he's like, hey, you know, if you want to play basketball, um, you know, let me know. Because he also had, um, this like a, a basketball school. So the club was like the higher level. And he had like another uh, basic club that were for people learning and that kind of stuff. I said, yeah, sure. So that's how it started. So um, it, it just went from there. I went and, and, and joined his club and I started at zero like everybody at a lower level. And um, after probably six months or so, he moved me up to the junior level. Because <laughs> although, you know, I was, I was running and jumping, I was taller than most kids and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, that's how basketball started for me. And, and the rest is, you know, basic history. I yeah. turned my back to soccer and everything else and the focus just stay in basketball uh, uh, part of it was I feel like I was among the people who kind of like were like me height wise it's kind of very difficult to grow at least it was for us during that time to grow up in Cameroon uh, with our height so we I had a lot of 
you know, we had a lot of issue with that. So basketball kind of became my little refuge. You know, like it was just a place where I was among people who as tall as me and enjoying themselves and playing this fun sport. And that's all it was for a while until I got a chance to come to the U.S. You mean you were bullied? Not well. It's it's not. <laughs> you probably can say that. Uh, the the thing uh, uh, when you grow up in some of those country, like people are not used to see people that tall. I mean, when I was 15 years old, I think, and I had this unbelievable growth spurt, uh in the space of maybe like in the span of like three or four months over the summer. I was probably like six, eight or something. And even before that, I was always taller than every kid my age, uh, my friends. So people like are not used to see people that tall even at a young age. So there was always a lot of like, you know, baby people making comment, whatever. Um, we all lived it. To be honest, all of us who are tall, who are, all my friends who were like, you are now six, eight, six, nine. So it was, it, it was just a situation where we, we just always felt like, uh, you know, people look at us like little alien around here, walking around and, and that kind of stuff. So, so basketball became that place for me. And from some of us, I have a friend uh, who's a girl. She also actually went to Georgetown, she's 6'8". So it, it was been worse for her. But wow. um, it became this little, you know, little, this, this little place for us just like to go express ourselves and be comfortable and enjoy a sports and have fun with friends. And so we did that every Wednesday, every Friday and Saturday there were games. And, and, and that's how we just created a little world there. And everybody basically is so connected because it was just like one or two gym where everybody went, everybody knew everybody else. And, you know, that was the, the um, a little treasure. <laughs> yeah, us. totally. That's cool. So you, so you come to the US, John touched on it. And uh, <clears throat> so after high school, you were there one year, right at Carroll, just one year. And then, and then coach Tom was coach Thompson, the one that was recruiting you initially, or was it coach Escherich? No. So coach Thompson, it was coach Thompson, coach Thompson, um, the late great coach Thompson retired in the middle of my sophomore year. Right. Um, so coach Escherich was assistant coach. So, yeah. So I went to Ashbishop Carroll high school with coach Holmes Um and then, you know, it was... Coach Holmes, wow. <laughs> yeah, with Coach Holmes. So it was actually easier for me to go to Georgetown because um, I had been in the U.S. for a year. I had a, an American family, a host family in D.C. So I was kind of comfortable being in D.C. And Georgetown, obviously, is a great school, academic-wise and basketball-wise. So, um, and I knew they wanted me to go there, so... It's a little bit natural. So I, I played for I played for late Big John <clears throat> for a year and a half. Um, and then uh, Craig Ashley took over. We hope you've enjoyed this interview thus far with Ruben Boomche Boomche, legendary Georgetown Hoya men's basketball player who played for the legendary coach, the late great Big John, John Thompson who he is now going to talk about, and then we'll talk about his experiences with the Portland Trailblazers of the NBA. For Dr. J, this is Hootie Hoot. Thanks again for joining us in the Sports Deli. We hope you have your favorite deli sandwich or bagel and your favorite beverage. And now back to the interview with Ruben Boomche Boomche right here in the Sports Deli. Did you appreciate who Coach Thompson was? Did you know What did you know about Coach Thompson? Because you had just come over, but he's an icon. And then talk about the recruiting process and how he talked to you because he's a former, well, unfortunately passed away, former big guy himself. Most people don't know, backed up Bill Russell with the Celtics um, from that standpoint. So I'm just curious. Yeah, there, there was not a lot of recruiting <laughs> with Coach Thompson. Actually, um, uh, I didn't know who he was. Uh, a, a quick story about it. So the, when I came to the U.S. and they actually told me about, you know, the Kennedy League and that kind of stuff a little bit. But I, I think I came in July of 96, if I remember, early July. Um, but I went to Georgetown to play pickup games. Right. Uh, and uh, this will tell you how much I didn't know about the U.S. and <laughs> even the players <laughs> in this story. Oh, boy. Uh, so I walked in the gym and I saw... Alonzo Mourning, Dikembe Mutombo, Patrick Ewing, and I'm like, 
what? <laughs> so I was mesmerized. I was like, I might, like I, I never connected that they went to Georgetown. I don't think I ever, I never, I never knew that. To be honest, I grew up in Cameroon. Yeah. Um, unlike some of my friends, I love basketball and I love, and I was just playing basketball for fun. I was like, you know, it would take me somewhere. It, it does. So I was not a lot into trying to follow what the American player were doing, the NBA player where they went to school. So I didn't right. know. <laughs> A lot of stuff about those guys. So I was first of all shocked. <laughs> I was like, you know, like, wow, all these guys are here. And then, you know, and um, so we played. So I I I I went in, change up, and then uh at some point I did put me in one of the team and I started playing with them. And another funny thing is before I get to Coach Thompson, um, at the end of the 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 games. There was another Cameroonian who was going to Georgetown, um, George Tuomo. So I asked him, I said, who's that, who's that skinny guy, short guy? He was like, man, he was kidding everyone. He's like, that's Allen Iverson. I'm like, who's Allen Iverson? <laughs> <laughs> because Allen Iverson, he said he's the number one pick in the NBA. I was like, okay. <laughs> I see <why. laughs> And um so wow. that very same day, uh, when after the games, when I was leaving and I was starting to walk out, somebody called me from the back. He said, Ruben. And I turn around and I see this man who was my height, bigger than me. I had no <laughs> idea who he was. I was, I got a little, not necessarily scared. I was like, okay. <laughs> and, and, and he just went, was like, you know, uh, you play well and you know whatever and he's like you need to come here you need to come here he's like you know <laughs> Patrick and Alonzo and there, there was a wall at Georgetown that has everyone who went to the NBA you know they the hang mm. uh, all the jersey on so he showed me the wall and say like you know you need to come here you can be like one of them you can have your jersey up here <laughs> so uh, I went home and I told um to my host parents and their reaction is what made me start realizing, you know, first of all, who's John Thompson, you know, what that means, the magnitude of, you know, the entire thing of, of being able to go to Georgetown, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's really when it started to hit me a little bit because prior to that, I didn't know anything <laughs> about those guys or, or, or the school or anything like that. Um, so when the season started in high school, obviously, a lot more interest from other team. Um, but actually, I didn't do any campus we put anywhere else. Um, so, you know, I would just go to Georgetown as much as I can to play with the guys whenever I was allowed to. And I just felt like, you know, um, great school, academic, basketball-wise, all those big guys, I, I'm sure it can't be that bad. <laughs> So I got, Ruben, I got two questions for you. Knowing the league you played in in high school, obviously it's a really good league, but it's one of those leagues where guys usually stay for four years. So you knew someone when they were freshmen. So you come into Carroll and you're a pretty tall guy and you come in there their senior year. People had to be freaking out on the other teams because they hadn't seen you. Did they know that Carroll was getting a seven footer coming in or did you just like show up and weren't really on the roster and just like some poor really little kid that was some poor some poor six eight kid going to buck now to study astronomy <laughs> got just got just got annihilated you know and, and is probably scarred for life because he, he didn't know about you yeah i think people found out um really quickly because words are spreading i'm sure they did i'm sure they summer. did <laughs> before school started um and yeah, because I, I, it was funny. After that day, I went to Georgia for the pickup game. Obviously, I went after that, and I, I did find myself in a couple of areas with my uh, my guardian at the time, and people would recognize me. And I was like, "How did they know about me?" They're like, "Oh yeah, we know." There's a guy who was like, "Oh yeah, you came from Cameroon. You just got here. You gonna go to Carroll?" <laughs> like what? <laughs> so I think I think people found out that there was a kid coming to Carroll. I'm sure a lot of people didn't know, unless you know they, they may have seen me over that summer. Right. Probably didn't know. They just heard about that he potentially is a good player. And uh, yeah, we had fun at at Carroll. Uh, yeah, there is there's a lot of team that unfortunately you know we kind of scar. <laughs> 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 that was 
but there was some good team too, Gonzaga and Demata. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We had really, really good team. I think we lost to Gonzaga uh, for the championship. Uh, it was a crazy. It was a fun game. It was crazy. It was a lot of people. Uh, it, 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 uh, it, it was really, really fun. I think we lost by a couple of points or so, but uh, I think we had a, we had a good year. It was a fun year. Sure. And my other question for you, coming from Cameroon, because I have some international friends, and trying to sp- explain college athletics, they don't get it. You know, they, because it's usually, you know, the high school and then sent pro and then the professionals. You know, other colleges, athletics is not what it is in the United States. When you got to, and I'm sure you got to learn from it, but how much did it surprise you? You know, when you get to the U.S., how important in particular college basketball is, in particular at Georgetown University, how it's almost like professional. I mean, you played at the Verizon Center, right? The Verizon Center. So yeah. You probably got more people for a Hoyas game than the Wizards get for a home game. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, you know, back in the day, back in the day when I was there, it was harder to get a Georgetown ticket than it was to get a yeah. Bullets ticket. And so did that just blow you away of how, you know, this that it's really a U.S. thing? Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't know what to expect. Um, actually, when I came for high school, I never practiced every single day <laughs> of the week, grew up in Cameroon. And then at Carroll, we didn't practice every single day. Uh, but I think we probably practiced three or four times a week. That was a little big change for me. And then going to Georgetown, yes, you're absolutely right. I didn't know what to expect. Um, the, the 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 people on campus and how people really root for sports, you know, basketball or football. It, it was totally different. I didn't know what to make of it in the beginning. Um, when we had our first games the, uh, at, at McDonald, actually the preseason game, and seeing you know all the people on the stand, even that you know it was. It was a little mind boggling for me because I never had that many people coming to a game, maybe except the championship game in high school. And yes, going to Verizon Center at the time and seeing just cars lining up to come to the game and how it was, it was, it was a great experience. And, um, you know, being there for the first time, obviously, uh, you, you know, you kind of <laughs> a little scared, you know, you kind of control your emotion. It was something new, you're not sure. Uh, how you're going to play, how people are going to receive it and whatever. So, um, but yeah, it, it, it's one of those things you got to go through, but uh, it, it's definitely not something that you will say, like you said, in Africa or in Europe at all. Uh, it's very an American thing. And, you know, I think it's great. It brings so many people together. It, it brings students, it brings alumni, it brings the community, you know, who, who root for, you know, all this college to do well. So it's, it's amazing to see. So you said you didn't really have uh, much of an understanding of the magnitude of, of uh, Big John. And, um, you know, with this racial reckoning that's going on um, and, the you know, we lost a lot of coaches this last year. You know, we lost Kobe. We lost Lou Olson. We lost Big John. Um, and sometimes people's impact is not felt until later from a historical perspective. And so I'm just wondering um, – you know, during your couple of years with him before Coach Eshrick took over, did you sense a shift with him as he was transitioning out? Um, did you see on a day-to-day basis his fight for the things that we're fighting for, you know, almost 20 years later? Um, you know, was that something that you were even cognizant about? Because, you know, you're just worried about day-to-day things back then. Yeah, so... <laughs> I mean, even after he retired, actually, he still will come around. <laughs> he was still, he was still right. there. <laughs> um, but no, you're absolutely right, actually. Um, this is one of the things about Coach Thompson um, talking about social issue, and we all lived it as, as, as a student or player of his. This is one of the reasons why so many people who play for him or got to know him um, or just sort of thing he was doing, like love him so much, you know, and revere him to, to be honest. Um, I've never had a coach like that at all. Um, I mean, he would, we would practice, he would stop practice maybe after a half hour or 45 minutes, whatever it is, he would say, you guys sit down, everybody sits down and he would bring up some topic, 
It might have been about education. It might have been, it might be about social, something happened, you know, maybe in the society that day or the week before. And he always, always, always were trying to um, have some kind of intellectual discussion with the group and make us aware of our environment or make us aware of issue around, or make us aware of things that maybe after Georgetown we can do, you know, uh, 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 to help. So it was never, never only about basketball with him. And I think everybody knows it, everybody who knew thing about Coach Thompson. So it was for us every day at practice, almost every day. I'm saying it could have been after practice, <laughs> you know, it was just talk. He would just, you know, maybe maybe he's screaming at us today and we're all <laughs> crying, but and then the next time we're laughing. <laughs> and then the next time it's a, <clears throat> it's a serious subject. So um, I was aware of those things um, uh, in part because I come from, you know, from Africa where there's a different perspective about certain things and how a lot of, People who really who you who live as a United States, especially in third world country, kind of look up uh, people who live like in the U.S. and that kind of stuff. And and I'm more uh, sometimes I think aware of some of the issue that are going on within the U.S. and even their own country sometimes, right? Because just the, the curiosity that we have. <clears throat> but Coach Thompson, um, he had a discussion with us all the time, and. Um, and at the end of the day, I think his message was always like for us to try to fight um, not only for ourselves, but people around us and try to make, you know, uh, uh, good for everyone, not only for us and trying to recognize, you know, the gap or the inequality that exists among people, it, you know, it may be because of race or finance, whatever it may be. So he always pushes us to, first of all, be, he wanted all his players to, you know, to really take school seriously and be educated and be intellectual because he knew and understood, you know, that there's a lot of issue around society that, you know, maybe I'm more in basketball and of my effect in your basketball career or the people. So it, it was really something that he always stressed on, always make, made us aware of. And, you know, we always listen, always. Last time I saw him, uh, I think it was about two years ago. I was at Georgetown. Had a long conversation. The man never changed. He always would tell you, okay. you know, um, what he thought, how he thought of things, or trying to bring you, make you aware of something that I know he said valuable. So, yeah. Ruben, I had a question for you. You, you know, you were a really strong academic student. I mean, sometimes it gets lost. You were a pre med. You were double major with mathematics and biology at Georgetown, not easy. And then you were also the Big East Scholar Athlete of the Year in 2001, not for basketball, for the entire conference, which is a huge deal. And my question is, how did you feel you were treated at Georgetown? Obviously, let's be frank, it's a, it's a predominantly Caucasian white environment. Um, a lot of students come from wealthy families. And, you know, and I'm just curious, not just you, but, you know, you in particular, but how did the, historically the team, the guys on the team, and obviously you're the big guys on campus. There's no football, George. There's football, but it's not <laughs> big time. It's, you're the, you're the sport. Let's be at, at Georgetown. You're the sport. That's what everybody knows Georgetown for. I'm just curious how you felt, you know, and also how did the players prior to you feel they got treated? And I'm sure you still talk to some of the guys or, you know, right now, has anything changed culture wise? I mean, culture-wise, um, I don't know how much change. Um, yes, I mean, outside of the fact that we were basketball players and, you know, a lot of people like us. I think to me, my experience personally um, uh, regarding the school, I love it. I, I honestly did not have any issue whatsoever. Uh, a lot of time, actually, I thought that because I was so driven academic-wise, um, I had a lot of teachers who just like me, <laughs> you know, it was, it was one of those things that people thought like, wow, this guy is not like the other players, you know, you know, for good or bad, whatever it meant for them. But I feel like there were people who um, wanted to be, get closer to me because I think they were impressed that I was so dedicated um, academically. And then I was, you know, like I said, math major or whatever. 
Um, so I had, uh, I remember, you know, the, the schedule, obviously basketball get crazy in the season and, and taking like really hard class. I think what it did for me sometime, uh, if I was going to be late for a day or two to turn back a, a paper or something, and I would just talk to the professor and they would understand it because they knew, you know, I was giving my best and returning the best. Like if I, you know, if I can't turn the paper on time, because we had a road game and I spent right. that time at night, which I did several times in the computer lab, mm-hmm. trying to finish the paper. So they'll give me a little bit of leeway. So I, but I, I, Ruben, I think- Ruben, I, back in the day, did they have the dot matrix printer? <laughs> The, the what? The, remember the printers went, uh, uh, yes. uh, 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 I could say, John, so you would know. Is, I would know. I, <laughs> Ruben, to be yeah. totally transparent, John and I were roommates in college, and he would p- run that printer at three in the freaking morning, <laughs> waking me up. And I'm like, John, now? Really? I got a paper at 8 a.m. It's due. I got a, oh, God, I'm killing me. Anyways, Ruben, sorry, Ruben. <laughs> no, it's, it's, you know, so um, from from the academic standpoint, um, I think a lot of teachers and actually one of the reasons I went back for my master was because of those teachers that were still there. Wow. After I retired, I reached out to one of them and, you know, right away, he basically told me like, you need to come back to Georgia to do that master. And I went and it kind of tells you a little bit, you know, how um, I really admired that school. I had a great experience. The president of the university at the time, um, you know, or he would stop, <laughs> he would see on campus, stop and come talk to me, <laughs> and yeah. things of that nature. Um, it's true that part of um, uh, 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 being a, an athlete, which uh, in some ways I think is probably not good, and I fell into that, is you, you kind of have a bubble sometime uh, where <clears throat> you're a lot more around your your teammate and some friends and and. And you, know, you, you kind of live in that bubble, it can be all good, right? Kind of like, um, so, uh, because also, I, I, I mean, I didn't have a life <laughs> most of the time in college, <laughs> right? between yeah. school and basketball. So um, I was not really out there, you know, really knowing exactly how everything was happening you know, on campus, um, you know, from other people's perspective. But uh, my experience was, was very, very positive. Um, you know, from teachers and the student and and my teammate. That's great. That's cool. Uh, well, you know, Coach Shaney, Coach Thompson, a lot of yeah. a lot of a lot of big time coaches we lost this year, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, you were lucky to have not only crossed paths with him, but you know, spent some such quality time with him. And yeah. uh, Coach Shaney, John, I, I, I'm sorry to cut you off. So, uh, yeah, go like ahead. I, the so. When I play for Coach Holmes at Carroll, I never had a coach who yelled that much. I was shocked. <laughs> like, and then I get to Georgetown. I'm like, okay, whoa. So it can be a little worse. <laughs> okay. And then we played Temple one day, one year. It must, it must have been, I think it was probably my sophomore year because I broke my wrist my freshman year. It, it could have been my freshman year too, preseason. Uh, there was a preseason game. We played Temple. Oh boy. And at halftime, they were leaving <laughs> us. I can't remember by how many points. Um, and the locker room were next to our locker room. <laughs> I can't wait and, to hear um, about this. <laughs> and Coach Cheney went into a tirade <laughs> that I'd never been heard from Coach Thompson to the point where we all got quiet. And Coach Thompson looked at us like, so you guys thought I'm the only one. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he went into, I was like, they were they winning. winning. They are winning. It's halftime. They are winning. <laughs> wow. I was like, is, and I started thinking, are they all the same? All this college coach? <laughs> <laughs> Ruben, have you ever seen the YouTube clip? This is a true, because John Calipari was at UMass, you know, and yeah. Cheney, and they hated each other, where That's Cheney exactly. stormed the press conference yes. for John yes. Calipari. <laughs> If anybody has it, it's worth the price of admission. It's the yeah, most I was unbelievable not surprised. thing. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I don't, I don't think I, have a word, I was aware of that clip, <laughs> but after I saw it years, whatever, I was not surprised. I'm telling you, that halftime conversation he had with his players <laughs> when they were winning the game, I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. <laughs> I mean, no. Yeah, that was, 
That was unbelievable. So yeah, fun time. They, weren't, they weren't hustling, boxing out, and uh, getting back on defense, right? Yeah. Yeah, in 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 in, in none so nice words. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So I, I wanted to ask you because uh, you had some great experiences. Uh, a lot of players back then didn't have great experiences on the road uh, with opposing fans. Um, and uh, as I touched on a little bit earlier about the racial reckoning, um, you know, you've been a part of the NBA from both sides, both as a player and, and uh, from an administrative standpoint. And so what were your feelings um, <clears throat> from an umbrella standpoint, just big picture in terms of uh, how the WNBA and the NBA were sort of at the forefront of, of this uh, racial reckoning to bring awareness which hopefully leads to policy changes uh, to bridge this economic and educational gap in particular, which is still huge that people, a lot of people don't understand or think is real. Um, but what, what were your feelings as, as uh, you were experiencing it uh, as, as a person of color? Yeah. Um, honestly, it's, I, so I was really proud of the players um, you know, for for all the effort that we're putting into it and really lead this char and trying to show people, um, you know, that it it really, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It, it has nothing to do with any of that. When, at the end of the day, we're all human beings, you know, we all have feelings. <laughs> we have families that we want to go to. We all strive to be happy, make the best of our life, whatever you know, that means for everyone. Um, so it was, it's still a difficult time, um, but it was really, it was really touching for me personally. Um, coming in the U.S. from Cameroon, where, I mean, to be fair, every country has the issue, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, it, it could be tribalism, it could be ethnic, whatever, they all have it. Um, but those experiences, as the player were talking about it, or as Black people talk about it, um, sometimes I can understand from a perspective of other, you know, other race, like, um, okay, so you can live in the, in the little bubble as well, where maybe it's hard for you to kind of like understand what, you know, other people are talking about, because you, you don't live that, you know, uh, maybe not necessarily day to day, but it's not something that, you know, you face with. Um, that's okay, but I think, Maybe as you point out, like the people who don't recognize it, I think that's where, from my perspective, there's a lot of frustration that grow like among you know black people or the people of color, uh, because we definitely have, and trust me, like I've had, <laughs> I've had lived this. Um, I you know I've, I've lived this in the U.S. I've lived this in France, so I've lived it in you know a lot of I lived it in Germany. <laughs> I've lived it in other countries in Europe, traveling with my spouse and whatever. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's a subject that I hope people can keep talking about because I think we have this tendency of talking about a lot of stuff for a period of time and then we go to the next subject. It's kind of like the nature of our society, especially in the US, a big topic come, we discuss it, we talk about it, there's protests or whatever. A year later, something has happened. Everybody turned the page on. <clears throat> so, um, you know, like I said, this has nothing to do with somebody's social economic status. Um, maybe I'm not going to say, you know, all black people are, are treated unfairly, all people of color are treated unfairly, all of them. No, I think it's just that certain time, the certain time or certain occasion where. Um, you might just find yourself in a situation where you feel like, you know, I, I'm, I'm treated unfairly because of the skin of my, the color of my skin. And that's, and it doesn't matter at that time <laughs> if you're a billionaire or you're middle class or whatever it is. Um, and it's real. I mean, it's, it's real. <clears throat> and I think for the people who, even if they don't live it, who don't want to understand it, and grabs that, you know, um, certain race are going through certain things. Uh, I, you know, that's the difficult part. But I think until they come around and understand that um, these things are happening, 
um, we may not get to the point where, you know, I think most people want to be, where it's where everybody feel safe, treated equally, can strive for whatever goal they have without worrying about, you know, um, uh, being prejudiced based on, you know, on something, the color or whatever else. So you, you have four kids? Yep. How, and how, how, how old are they, if I can ask? Uh, they're 11 to 1. Oh. <laughs> so the oldest okay. one is 11. I have two boys, two girls. Um, the boys are 11 and 8, and the girls are uh, 5 and 1. So the 11 and the 8-year-old probably have a little bit better understanding of, of what was transpiring. How Have you had to talk with them? Have you explained to them the differences? Are they old enough to handle that type of, of uh, heavy topic? We, my wife and I, and, and my wife is from Illinois, so my wife is white, um, but our, our kids look like me. <laughs> you would never know that the mother is white. I wish also she's had some issue with people <laughs> when she, you know, she's been alone with the kids, um, making comment or following her in the, on, in the store thinking maybe she stole the kids or something, but Jesus. that's a different topic. Uh, um, so we, we debated about this. Uh, in the beginning, we're not quite sure how to handle it and how much, um, you know, we can basically make them aware of or how in a thing as things just got, was getting just crazier, uh, we decided we're gonna talk to them about it, not, you know, with like profound detail. <laughs> But at least we, we, for us, for our family, we just kind of told them like in general, you know, there are certain people who kind of view themselves maybe a little more special than others. And they tend to treat us other people unfairly. And we're trying to describe like a very simple word. And we just told them that they need to understand and know that, you know, it's something that might always be there in this world, but that everybody is pretty equal um and god loves every kid every race doesn't matter what it is um so you have to see your friends whatever color they are it has nothing to do with the color it just who the other people so we had that conversation um really in, in the most simple way um that we could for them without going too much into any detail because obviously they're still quite young um, so it was only with the boys, actually. <laughs> so the, the girls, you know, um, are still very young. My daughter was, was in the room. She'd been <laughs> playing something else. But with the two boys, at least, you know, we wanted to make them a little bit aware of it. Uh, they watched the TV a little bit, you know, not most of it uh, during those events. But um, so at least they have it. So we, we're just going to, you know, keep talking to them and trying to educate them uh, the best that we can. And just trying to um, um, put in the head, you know, how, you know, we all human beings, we all bleed the same blood and uh, we should all be treated equally because that's what we are. Yeah, it, it's every time we hear stories like this, because other guests have come on, Lindsay Gottlieb came on, an assistant coach with the Cleveland Cavaliers. She's white, her husband's black, and she had an issue in the airport where... <laughs> They didn't believe that her her kids were her kids, and I'm um, really sorry for your wife having to experience that. It's just <laughs> uh, as if there's not other yeah. reminders constantly that you have to have that kind of reminder. Is just uh, uh, I just I can't even imagine going through something like that. That completes part one of the interview with Ruben Boomche Boomche, who played for the legendary coach John Thompson at Georgetown University, and later went on to play three years in the NBA before retiring after playing overseas for seven years. Remember, your voice matters when fighting systemic racism. Read a book, acknowledge your white privilege, watch a movie about institutional racism, call your local or state representatives, and or have a conversation with someone that doesn't look like you so we can change the economic, educational, home ownership, police reform, and prison narratives that currently need to be changed in this country. For Dr. J, I'm Hootie Hoot. Remember, you can always send us an email to thesportsdeli at gmail.com. 
or you can DM us on Instagram at Mike Hootner or on Twitter at Michael Hootner. Stay tuned for part two of the interview with Ruben Boomche Boomche, where he will discuss his time in the NBA. And you don't want to miss our very famous The Sports Deli Rapid Fire This or That segment with Ruben. And until part two, please mask up. Remember, Black Lives Matter. Peace.